Well, welcome to our seminar. <clears throat> it's only January 15th. No need to worry about sales, is there? Well, we want to avoid a drizzle becoming a storm. Welcome to this. Welcome to the webinar. I'm going to draw on the ideas in my book, Innovate Now, Scale Up with 16 Breakthrough Sales Techniques. This is a power 30-minute webinar. It's going to go very quickly. If there's time at the end, maybe we could take a question or two. But thank you all for joining. So it was the first sales meeting of the year, it was January 15th, and the, and the CEO of the firm was worried because sales was off. The salesperson said, uh, hey, don't worry, boss, relax. It's only January 15th. There's, there's plenty of time to catch up. The question is, is there time to catch up? The CEO was not so sure. Isn't it usually true that the longer you wait, the harder it becomes to catch up. Isn't that kind of like a truism that we face, right? It's harder. It's harder to catch up. It's better to be ahead of budget this time of the year than behind. Because you know what happens when we fall behind and we don't hit the deadline. We, we usually never do catch up. And sometimes what begins in our business is a slow leak, right? It begins as a slow leak. It becomes a serious problem. Now, what are some sources of sales leaks that we face? Well, not enough sales effort, not enough sales call, and weak sales calls. And together, they can be a real flood. And what we don't want to see are sea turtles floating around in our business. Consider billionaire Ross Perot, founder of EDS. In 1962, at the age of 32, he hit his annual sales quota by January 31st. By June of that year, he had started his own company, EDS. Quite a different position than the salesperson who says, no worries, boss, it's only January 15th. And don't forget a recession is looming out there. We've had recessions every 10 years for the last 30 years. When do you expect the next one? So increasing your network, your market share now is a great way to prepare for the next recession. And by the way, the yield curve is turning flat or negative, which is also usually a sign that a recession is coming. Now, this is definitely not a good game plan, hoping for the best. So instead of waiting, is there something we can do? Can we time pace? Can we cause sales to move faster, right? So time pacing is an idea that was popularized in the 1990s by 3M who said that they wanted 30% of their profits to come from businesses that didn't exist five years ago. They weren't milking existing product lines like scotch tape and post-it note. They weren't waiting for it to become a buggy whip, which is a metaphor for an absolute product. By the way, if these ideas interest you, you could read about them in Competing on the Edge. <laughs> so we want to time pace sales. We want to make it happen faster. The time period till a prospect invites us into a conversation, gives us an opportunity to bid, gives us our first order. We want to make it happen now. And our, our focus for the most part for today is going to be on inviting us into a conversation. So we're looking for relationship accelerators. <clears throat> we can start with good planning. Why? We want to make sure we have a plan that has a chance of working. We could be tired at the end of a day. We could think we put in a good day, but the question is, did we do the right thing? Let's say we have a budget of $1 million we want to sell this year. This works out to $20,000 a week with two weeks off of vacation and no seasonality. So if our closing ratio is 33%, we want to put $60,000 of good opportunity in the pipeline every week. Now, good opportunity means there are PIKs, payments in kind. That means the prospect is doing something, visiting our plan, checking a reference, introducing us to their boss. They're doing something to show that they're committed to the sale, to the sales process. So two key issues we have to look at then are quantity of effort and quality of effort. Quantity of effort and quality of effort. So let's look at the difference on um, both quality and quantity with best efforts versus do or die. Best efforts means you put in your best effort, right? Your best effort. Well, it's really hard to catch up when you're behind on January 15th with best efforts. What we need is do or die. In fact, Deming, the, the father of statistical process control, 
was quoted as saying that best efforts won't work. Well, if you're behind, if you're trying to do new business development, we usually find that best efforts fails 100% of the time. So if you don't hit your pipeline sales numbers in week one, let's apply do or die to the pipeline. Well, a best effort salesperson will try to hit the numbers again in week two, right? They'll try to hit the numbers again in week two. But in do or die, we know we need to double the, the sales numbers in week two, right? So if you don't hit your numbers in week one, let's say it's $20,000 a week. In week two, you got to hit $40,000. That's what do or die means. Now, to improve the quantity of your effort, for every dollar you hope to sell, have five good do uh, dollars in the pipeline. Here's a pipeline maintenance idea. Don't think that everything you have in the pipeline is going to close, particularly when there's uncertainty. Also, on the quantity, a good way to uh, time pace getting more calls in, make ten now, no, drinking rum before 10 makes you a pirate. That's the wrong slide. This is the one I wanted. 10 before 10, make 10 business development calls before 10 in the morning. It improves the quantity of effort. You know, it's hard, it's hard to have uh, good results if you're not making any effort. So we also want to improve the quality of our effort. To do that, we need to usually overcome the three fatal flaws in selling. So what are these? The first fatal flaw is assuming the prospect enters the conversation with serious intent. Typically, they won't. So there are two kinds of conversations we face in selling, safe and serious, safe and serious. In a safe conversation, the prospect is in it for a different reason than you are. Typically, they're a tire kicker. They're doing a price check. They're looking for a free education. So a safe conversation, you're never going to close. You're never going to get a stick of business. In a serious conversation, the prospect has a compelling need, and they're willing to share it with you. Serious doesn't mean you closed. Serious means you opened. Now, the idea of a safe versus serious conversation enters when we're faced with the parole officer scam. So what is that? It's telling you what you want to hear to get what they want to get. So what would be an example? Let's say you're, you've, been, uh, you've got a campaign. You've been targeting a big prospect for many years. And uh, they've never given you a tumble. They've never given you an uh, opportunity to even uh, quote. And then uh, one year, they call you up out of the blue, this prospect, and says, yeah, Andy, I think this is your year. And you're excited. So they invite you to come over and, and, and to study their needs and present a quote. And, and if they said to you, you know, Andy, there's no way I'm ever going to give you any business. If they said that, there's no way you would spend a lot of time on that proposal. So buyers are sophisticated, and this is what they say to you. They say, Andy, I know you've been trying to get my business for a long time. It's probably been frustrating that I haven't given you any business. Well, I want to tell you that uh, the reason I haven't given you any business is because Joe's been my guy. I've been buying from Joe. But, you know, in the last six months, something's gone wrong with Joe. He doesn't return his phone calls in a timely manner. Um, there are unexplained charges on invoices. The quality and service what it isn't what it used to be. And Andy, I've heard great things about you in the marketplace. I think this could be your year. Why don't you come in and quote? That's what he says. <clears throat> and so you're really excited. You go in there, you do your quote, and then they, they take your quote and they, they use it to beat the living hell out of Joe. It's, it's just a price check. You were the whipping boy or you're the whipping girl. So the preventative to the parole officer scam to make sure you're in a serious conversation are strong PIKs. Don't look at what the prospect says, look at what the prospect does. So an example again might be they visit your plant, they, um, they introduce you uh, to a, a boss or a peer that's involved, they could do a reference check. These are all examples of PIKs. They fill out a credit, ref, uh, a, credit, uh, a credit form, they apply for credit. The second fatal flaw is assuming the prospects believe what we say. In general, the, plus, the prospect doesn't believe anything we say. Prospects are risk averse. They're skeptical. So what's a corrective? One important corrective is uh, testimonial letters. So the average client with whom I've worked, I've worked with over 100 clients, has, has little or no testimonial letters. And what you want are genetically engineered testimonial letters. What does that mean? 
It means it has two qualities. First of all, the economic justification, the before and after, what it was like before working with you, what it was like after working with you. And secondly, what was the objection the prospect had to overcome? Typically, typical objections we face are, one is, you know, your price is too high. So you want a testimonial that says, yes, when I bought from you, I actually made more money. But the more common objection that shuts down all selling is I'm good. What do we say when I'm good? And the third fatal flaw is assuming the prospect knows how to make a good decision. Often they can't, and particularly for the infrequent decision. Now, I've studied over a dozen different selling systems, and I think they were good in their time when they first came out. The marketplace wasn't as, as, as competitive. It wasn't as brutal. But I think in today's day and age, having these kind of fatal flaws a different or a different approach is needed a diff, an approach based on urgency and so we're going to continue to go for quality and quantity to overcome this problem that our sales are off on the 15th of the month of the year now how do we get more access right we want to get more access faster we want to have more appointments faster access is the coin of the realm in selling and the easiest way to get access when you have delighted customers is to get introductions warm introductions from delighted customers that's the easiest way to build the business faster the power of introductions also referred to as the net promoter score is discussed in this book, The Ultimate Question by Fred Reschold. Reschold holds out the idea, and I think it's, it's, it's validated by our common sense experience, that there's good profits and bad profits. Uh, bad profits means you victimize your customer. Good profits means it's win-win. You raise your prospect to a higher level of well-being, and we make a profit. So when it's good profits, when our clients are delighted, they're usually our greatest selling asset. And the question is, are we using our greatest selling asset to get more introductions, to get access, to grow our business right now? So why is it important to ask for introductions? For most business, introductions are the super highway to growth into the future. So what do I mean? Let's take an example. Let's look at Sally's story. Sally, who wasn't hired to ask. So we had a program with a company that did about $35 million in sales annually, and half the sales were with one big Fortune 500 company. And in one week of the program, the, the assignment was bring in an introduction next week. That was the assignment. So then we're in a one-to-one -one coaching the next week, and we're talking to Sally and say, Sally, how did it go? Did you bring in any introductions? And Sally says, no, I didn't get any. I say, okay, Sally, how many people did you ask? I said, nobody. I said, Sally, did you know we all had an assignment? We were all supposed to bring in one introduction. And she said, yeah, I knew that. I said, so what happened, Sally? She said, well, you don't understand, Andy. When I was hired 22 years ago, my job was to watch that phone. When that phone rings, I pick it up, I race over to my client, I take care of their needs, and then I drive back, come to the office, sit down on my desk, and I wait for the phone to ring. That's my job. So he said, you know, Sally, I got it. I understand. Here's the problem. <clears throat> your client, your relationship with your client, that's the super highway to growth in the future. And you're the only person who calls on that client. And if you don't ask that client for introductions, nobody's going to ask them for introductions. So, Sally, you have a choice. You can stay in your position, but then you got to get introductions. Or we can move you to another position, which, by the way, would pay a third less. Don't you know it? Two weeks later, Sally had an introduction. She tapped the super high wave of growth. Well, let's say that um, this is not something that's commonly going on in your company, asking for introductions. So how do you do it? You might look for the magic moment of access, which is what? You've met a client's needs. You confirm they meet their needs. You ask them if there's anything else they need. They don't have any other needs. And this is the magic moment of access. Now, why do we say this? Very often, the only time you can get contact with a customer is when they need something from you, right? When they need something from you. So if you're working on a project and you've satisfied their needs and you're calling to follow up, this could be the magic moment of access. Very often, salespeople run right past this moment. Why? Because they're acting in project management mode. What does that mean?
It means they got a list of people they got to call and they got to make sure everything's okay. And so they say, hey, did you get the quote? Did you get the purchase order? Did, I mean, you, did you get the sample? Did you get the shipment? You just check to make sure everything's okay. And then you cross it off on your list and you run off to the next, the next project. And in the process, you run right past the selling opportunity. So what are some of the things you could do in that magic moment of access? Well, if the customer is pigeonholing you, if they're only buying one item from you, you could break the pigeonhole and you could ask them, would you consider buying item B from me? Or you can ask for an introduction or you could ask for a testimonial letter. The key is, the key is use the magic moment of access. And we recommend that you put an image or a sign right up on, on, on our screens to remind us because we could go right past them. Now, how do you ask for an introduction? If salespeople haven't been regularly asking for an introduction, they may not do it well, or they might just say, I don't know how to do it. So here's a script to ask for an introduction. First, you confirm the prospect is, or client is happy with your work. Why? Because if they're not happy with your work, are you going to ask them for an introduction? So you ask them if they're delighted. The next question is, would you be willing to refer us? And if they're if they're delighted with your work, they'll be happy to refer you, particularly because they think the next question is going to be, do you know anybody? But that's not the next question. If they're willing to refer us, here's what we say. I notice you're connected on LinkedIn to Jane Brown of ABC Company. I would like to meet her. Do you know her well enough to make an introduction? And it's either yes or no. And ideally, you know, you're going to have several people you want to, to whom you want to be introduced. So do you know her well enough? And so the key is obviously you need to link in with all your, your, your big fans and you have to study their LinkedIn network on the premise they share it before, um, uh, before you make the phone call. Now we've talked before, there are two approaches to our ideas. One of the approaches is do or die and one of the approaches is best efforts. So what does that mean? Well, Let's say we're going for introductions on a do or die basis. In the first case, a do or die salesperson asks for introductions 100 out of 100 times, always asks for, um, always asks for an introduction. But if we commit ourselves to an introduction program, for instance, let's say we're going to ask for one introduction a month, one introduction a month, and now we sit down in a one-to-one. -one. If a sales team member does not have one introduction in a month, then how many do they owe in month two, right? On a best efforts basis, most salespeople would go for another, you know, just one. But on a do or die basis, we're going for two in the second month. We're going for two introductions. So these are ways that the do or die principle kind of infiltrates itself into our selling effort. We want to act in a do or die basis as if we're always facing the bear at the edge of the cliff. No matter how good things are, we want to see things in a do or die uh, context to keep us sharp, to sharpen the edge. Now we need to create a sense of urgency or respect once we first meet a prospect. Why? Because there's kind of like um, a getting to know you dating period between first contact and in market. And if we don't get urgency and respect in that period, we're going to face the wolf who wants to rip our throat out and wants a fire sale. So what do I mean by this? If you're not the incumbent, if you're trying to win business away from somebody and you meet somebody, you meet a prospect and the prospect says, not now, I'm glad I met you, Andy, but not now. We're not, we're not making a decision now. We're going to make the decision in about, you know, two, three months. That's your key selling period. Because if by the end of those two to three months, that prospect does not take you seriously, you're just going to be a whipping boy, a whipping girl, a price check, right? So again, you've got, in many cases, two to 12 months, two to three months, you have to win the urgency and respect of that prospect, or they're not going to take you seriously. And in the end, they're going to look to you to be just a fire sale. So say you connect with the prospect and now you're in harm's way. So if we go back a step, it's very possible if you're not doing new business development, you'll never be in harm's way and you don't need any of these things. But let's say you are in harm's way because you've made 10 phone calls before 10, you've got introductions, you're talking to a prospect and the prospect says, I'm good. You see, business development puts us in harm's way.
And if we're doing real business development, why? Then we need to be prepared to deal with problems like, I'm good. So very often when we talk to a prospect, he or she will pre um, present a veneer of I'm good, but it often turns out they're really drowning. And our job in selling is to save them, which is kind of ironic, because on the one hand, they're pushing us on the way. On the other hand, we have the solution to their problems. So a recommendation um, for your organization is you should do I'm good drills. What do you say in 20 seconds? What does your sales team member say in 20 seconds that makes a difference? Like, are we talking about type three knowledge? Are we talking about false peaks? I'm calling today to talk about type three knowledge regarding, in my case, selling, or to help you in case you're on a false peak of well-being with respect to sales. Well, let's take a little bit of an in-depth look of these. After I make this one point, drill against the clock, drill against the clock. So I'm calling to help you today evaluate if you're on a false peak of well, well-being. So many people who've achieved success are looking down and they look at how far they've accomplished and they miss the higher peak of well-being that's right near them. So this is a way to get somebody into a serious conversation. Well, how do you do that? How do you show them you're going to get them to a higher peak of well-being? Well, we do this with type three knowledge. Type one knowledge is what you know. Type two knowledge is what you know you don't know. And type three knowledge is what you don't realize you don't know. So imagine if your sales team was calling saying, I coined today to discuss, to discuss type three knowledge regarding your product and how to help you get to a higher peak of well-being. Does that get you a shot of being in a serious conversation? Here's another one to challenge a prospect. I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that. All my clients require fantastic. We help them off four summits. We show them a higher peak they can reach with type three knowledge. So implicitly what's behind this little script is, are your sales team members challenging the prospect? Are your sales team members challenging the prospect's thinking? Now you might say that these are pattern interrupters pattern interrupters for the buyer who's programmed to say I'm good so you reach out he or she says I'm good and we need to interrupt the pattern so to pierce the veneer of I'm good again we need a pattern interrupter so you might check in what are your pattern interrupters you know it takes a heroic salesperson to begin the journey of business development so if you want to recover from it's January 15th, we're behind and you want to get ahead, it helps if we have a heroic salesperson. Now what's involved in a heroic salesperson? He or she is facing, I'm good. This isn't relevant to a work, the closed mindset. They're facing a closed mind. And a key to success here is moving the prospect around the curve to exploration and learning. Now what we're looking at right now is the learning curve, the change curve, and it's drawn on a book from a book called On Death and Dying, where the underlying premise is that all change involves grieving, and that this is the journey we need to take a prospect on to help them reach that higher level of well-being. And the key right here in what makes a salesperson a hero is going from resistance to exploration. And how do we do it? We do it by showing they're on a false peak of well-being with type three knowledge. Now, in ancient myths, the heroes faced fire-breathing dragons, but there are no real fire-breathing dragons today. So what do we face? We face dragons of the mind. So a heroic salesperson is someone who's able to overcome these dragons of the mind. A sense of guilt, very often a prospect wants to continue dealing with someone with whom they have a relationship. Ignorance, complacency, laziness, but most importantly, what makes salespeople heroes is overcoming the closed mindset. This is what moves civilization forward. This is what moves organizations and companies forward. This is what moves our life forward. A heroic salesperson takes the prospect with a closed mind and brings them to exploration. These are heroic salespeople. Okay. Let's go back to quantity of effort for a moment. We have found that it's important to set, if you're a field salesperson, a minimum number of field sales calls a day. 
In many businesses, if you make two field sales calls a day and they're properly qualified and you're getting PIKs, it makes the whole thing work. But you got to do it on a do or die basis. What does that mean? Well, let's say Monday's a little slow and we only make one call on Monday instead of two. That means we have to make up that deficit of one the rest of the week. We don't need eight more. We need nine more. And by the way, a great way to make sure that your, your calendar is flush with great appointments is if it's a good call and you're getting, a, if you're getting PIKs, one key PIK payment in kind is set your next appointment before you leave. Set your next appointment before you leave. That makes it a lot easier to get to 10 plus sales calls a week. And now, you could apply the same idea if you do 100% phone selling. Whatever your target is per day, do it on a do or, day, do or die basis. So if you don't make it on day one, make it up the rest of the week. And if you don't have two sales calls, we usually need to pound the sales, uh, the phone, 70 to 100 dials a day. And isn't it much better to get warm introductions? These and many more ideas are described in my book, Innovate Now, 16 Sales Innovation Techniques to Scale Up Your Business. Well, we all know that Rome wasn't built in a day. So we've almost come to the end of today's uh, webinar. But we do have one more thought. Before leaving, I would just comment to you, if you have any questions, write to me at andy at urgencybaseselling.net. So here's one more thought introduced by Dave. You know who Dave was. He, he uh, developed, he founded, and grew Wendy's. And Dave famously said, that when you make a burger, you need to spread the ketchup and the other condiments evenly because the last bite of the burger has to be as good as the first bite. And we're kind of at the last bite of the burger here. So the implication for presentations is always end strongly when you, when you present. So we all know that bad decisions make for great stories, right? Bad decisions make for great stories. And we have such an example for you as our last story of the day. So here's a classic. Remember that first sales meeting of the year where the CEO was worried? Sales were off. Hey, says the CEO, it's January 15th and sales are off. I'm worried. And we had that salesperson who says, boss, relax. It's only January 15th. We have plenty of time to catch up. Well, I bet it won't surprise you to hear that salesperson failed and lost his job. But then we had another salesperson who set a goal he wanted to close one new customer a day, one a day, which meant five a week. And he did it on a do or die um, basis. And he did the program. And let me tell you what happened as a result. He went from earning $200,000 a year to 380000 in his best year. Excuse me, 380000 on average. His best year was four seventy. Well, it looks like we're just about at the end of the seminar. So what's it going to be? Are you worried about sales on January 15th? Are you going to approach it on a best efforts or on a do or die basis? So thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, please join us on February 11th, 11 a.m. for our next webinar, Why Are Customers Disrespectful? If we don't do both good cop and bad cop, we're going to have disrespectful customers. Well, it looks like we have time for one question. If you'll use chat, if anybody has a question, I'll be glad to end, answer one if I can. We just have a minute left. Uh, here's a question. What if there's a radical change in the market, like new competition comes in, and there's just no easy way to do this? Th you do all the things that you would describe here in the seminar, and they don't work. Well, the last idea I would leave with you is, is twofold. It comes from a, a book called Innovating by Louise Breva, who said that today is the prototype for tomorrow. You got everything you need uh, to, pro to, to innovate right now. This would call for an innovation. And then I would also reference Measure What Matters, in which is described like the Intel innovation of the 8088 processor. And what we learned from that is we need to set bold goals and understand we may need to invent new things. So allow for the possibility you may need to invent new things to hit your objectives this year.
Well, it looks like it's about 1030, so I'm going to sign off now. Again, if you have any follow-up questions, write to me at andy at urgencybaseselling.net. You could reach me by phone at 201-415-3447, and the website is www.urgencybaseselling.net. Thanks again for joining, and I'm going to end the conversation now, end the, converse, end the webinar. Bye-bye now.